Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. Quebec NDP MP Jamie Nichols' first exposure to Parliament was when he accompanied his dad, a truck driver, on his dad's regular runs to deliver paper to government ministries in Ottawa. Jamie's dad had always hoped that his son might become a member of Parliament, but Jamie followed a different path. He studied fine arts, he taught, he earned a degree in landscape architecture. But then, in 2011, he took the plunge and became a member of Parliament. Jamie Nichols joins me now to talk all about life beyond politics. Jamie Nichols, welcome to Beyond Politics. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here, Catherine. So tell me how you're enjoying Ottawa. How's it been? Uh, I love Ottawa. It's a great city, and uh, I wake up every morning and think I have one of the best jobs in Canada. Do you really? Yeah. Well, that's good because, I mean, it would be pretty crummy if you were waking up thinking, what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> you knew Ottawa before this, though, because um, I understood that your dad was, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought he was um, a truck driver uh, as one of his professions and that he had a contract uh, that brought him to Ottawa regularly. Is he that, was a truck right? driver. He worked for a company that supplied paper for the computers for the federal government. Wow. Um, so that was my introduction to Ottawa was uh, working with him on his truck and going through the back doors of different departments and uh, and um, the Lange, Lange block yeah. and, and whatnot. And so that was my first introduction to Ottawa. And what did you think at the time? Do you remember as a kid what you remembered about the Well, the thing I remember the, the clearest um, was the efficiency that my dad would go through his route, one, but also the reception that he would get at different places. Sometimes the reception was very favorable. They knew him by name. And other times it was less favorable if he went through a front door rather than the service delivery door, huh. he would be treated uh, uh, quite badly. So as a, a, a child, I, I observed the way that uh, the government was interacting with my dad. How did it impact your impression of the government? Um, it impacted my impression in terms of uh, knowing that different people and different people's attitudes and their uh, relationship with each other could make for a positive working environment or for a negative working environment. And uh, I also remember uh, I took away the negative parts of it and remembered that uh, maybe those things need to be improved and people have to treat all people regardless of origin or social standing uh, with respect. Mm -hmm. um, you, when you were that kid going through, in some cases, the back door for your deliveries, did it ever occur to you that you might one day, or did you ever think, I would like one day to walk through the front door as a, you know, as a, even as a civil servant or, or more specifically as a member of parliament? I don't think the civil service ever truly appealed to me. Um, and throughout my life, I tried to go into creative fields. Um, but I know that it was an ambition of my father for me that he sort of wished that I would go through that front door one day. Oh and, wow! Yeah. Did he did he vocalize that to you? He he did vocalize it to me in my teens. Um, I was quite an argumentative teenager in in school <laughs> yeah. at home. Okay. We used to have uh, good debates. And right. My father would always play the devil's advocate okay. on any any thought that I had and drive you crazy and would drive me crazy. Yeah. And, uh, but it, uh, it showed him that the, the strength of his son's argumentation may be that I would pursue a career in law or in politics. Did he say those things in a positive way? Or? He, did, he did say <laughs> okay. those things in a positive okay. way. Okay. Um, his, his idea of uh, pol politicians and law at the time was quite negative, but he always thought that we need more people to contribute a part of positive aspect. Right. Yeah. Um, tell me about your mom. My mom worked for the Bank of Montreal for 35, over 35 years. Right. So she was a very stable uh, presence in our family. And um, Was this in your home community or was this in, in Montreal? In my home community. Worked, there was a period of time where she worked at uh, in Montreal yes. for human resources, but most of the time she was a branch manager. Okay. 
uh, either in the West Island of Montreal or in our home community of uh, Hudson St. Lazare. Right. Uh, so she was a very strong presence in the community and uh, she showed me the importance of contributing to your community. Right. How did she do that? When you uh, talk about showing you the importance, I mean... Well, outside of her working hours, she would volunteer for different organizations and she would give of her time to the community outside of working hours of the bank, which uh, is quite, quite a contribution. Yeah. And were you a big family? Uh, we were a small family. Okay. Uh, it was me and my brother. Right. But we did have, up until the 1980s, we had our extended family, so cousins, aunts and uncles. Uh, my mother's of Francophone origin, so the idea of my grandfather was that you always have the extended family around. Right. Um, but as time progressed, people sure. moved out of Quebec and right. uh, it ended up being just us in the end. Was your dad an Anglophone? My right. dad was an Anglophone. He was. Yeah. So interesting. Do you know how they met? Uh, they met. They met at a bowling alley. Yeah. Um, and uh, my mother always jokes that uh, he. My mother was. The, I actually shouldn't say this, but <laughs> <laughs> they Please met. At, <laughs> they met at a bowling alley. Yeah. Um, and uh, my dad asked my mother if she needed a ride home, and that's how they met. Okay, you're totally caging the details there. <laughs> <laughs> I am to, to protect uh, my mother and father. Okay. Um, um, did, they, did either of them speak the other's language? Yes. Did you, they did. Yeah. So they were uh, able to communicate. Because my mother's mother was uh, Anglophone origin. Okay. And actually, uh, because they lived with my great-grandmother, right. um, my great-grandmother, who was Scottish origin, uh, refused to let them speak French in the house wow. because she thought that they were speaking about her. So, so my grandfather uh, never actually spoke his mother tongue with, uh, with his wife. Isn't that uh, amazing? Yeah, yeah. So how did that impact you growing up then, having both of the languages in the house? Was there an expectation that you would speak one or the other or simply that you would speak both? The expectation was that we would speak both. Right. Um, right from the very beginning. And uh, my grandfather was a sovereigntist, so he was very uh, strong on the point that we we know French. Right, and, yeah. and properly. And properly, so we were sent to Francophone schools um, and, and schooled in, in French. Okay, and how did your dad feel about it? Uh, my dad felt po very positive about it because he knew that he had, um, he had difficulty speaking French. And he saw that with the way uh, things were transitioning, that uh, if he had been able to speak French, he would have had more opportunities um, to advance. He often talked about uh, switching from driving on the truck to the sales department mm -hmm. of the company. And I think because of the lack of French that he never could quite make that transition. Did he resent it, not um, being able to? I don't think he ever resented it. I think he just looked at it as a fact. Um, and uh, something that he can uh, change reality. in lives. Yeah, something that he could change in, in his son's life. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it true that your dad was a beekeeper? It is true. Oh, wow. Um, once he retired, he followed his passion, which was beekeeping. Prior to retiring, he uh, took a master's beekeeper course at Cornell. And, uh, wow, that's amazing. I had no idea that such things existed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I would get a lot of stories about the bees, and I realized that that was his passion, and he made friends in the beekeeping community right. that I still keep in contact with. Wow. What, what was the passion about the bees? Did he ever talk to you about it? About I think what it was the, the whole process of going and visiting the hives and seeing how they're doing and, and the process of, of smoking them so that they would be calm. And I think it, it had a calming influence on him mm -hmm. and a meditative quality to it. Uh, that he would never vocalize that sure. he, it would be uh, he he wouldn't be worried worried about it. But from from my observation of him, it did have this meditative uh, effect. Yeah. Um, and there was something in his inner life that uh, could be expressed through uh, the practice of beekeeping. I always think it's fascinating when um, people at a certain stage in their life turn to a hobby or an interest that is not really mainstream necessarily, mm -hmm. and, and that requires, I mean, in his case, quite um, uh, significant training mm -hmm. at, at a prestigious institution. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it's a reflection of a, a passion that they've had. And I think yeah. that's really very interesting. Yeah, I was very proud of him that he actually followed pursued through. that I mean, yeah. and followed through um, because he came up with a lot of ideas for, for projects and plans. His father was a town, the town planner for the town of Point Claire, and uh, he always had this planning aspect of his character where he would make plans, but we used to always laugh because the plans would never be followed okay. through with. Did so, he blame that on trying to raise two sons? I don't One think he did. One of whom was argumentative? He, I, no. <laughs> I don't think that he did, okay. um, but in retrospect that probably played a large part. Um, but uh, to see him follow through on, on a dream that he had was uh, especially rewarding. Sure. Yeah. You know, you talk about that planning aspect, um, and obviously uh, one was a town planner and therefore obviously had to be somewhat successful in what they were doing. And you said your dad, uh, for various reasons, was probably a little less successful in following through on the plans. But you seem to have been a planner. You followed that type of a path too, didn't mm -hmm. you? Not well, initially, I guess. You not didn't. initially. Initially, I was uh, more of a free spirit. Right. I studied art, Arts, uh, yeah. and painting, and photography, and practice as an that's artist. That's what you thought you would probably. That's what I thought yeah. I would probably pursue. Right. Um, and somewhere in Istanbul, when I was living there, I decided that uh, maybe my career path lay elsewhere. All right. So we need to take a step back. How did you end up in Istanbul? <laughs> Well, uh, it was 1998, and uh, I was jobless at the time. Yes. And uh, as a practicing artist, uh, not really knowing what I was going to do. Um, and so I started looking overseas for work, and I found a, a job online uh, working at a, an elementary school in Turkey. Wow. And so I applied to the job, and... Uh, I had an interview and didn't think much of it, thought uh, they didn't phone me back, uh, so I must not have gotten the job. Well, a month and a half later, they phoned me and they said, can you be here in three days? At which point, uh, I packed up two pairs of pants, <laughs> two shirts, and, uh, a toothbrush. Went off, and a toothbrush and went off to Istanbul. And um, what was your job? I taught uh, English to elementary school students. And eventually I transitioned to teaching them art because that was my specialty. Right. And then the last two years that I was there, I became a university instructor in design. That's amazing. How long were you there? I was there for five years. What a fascinating place to be. Yeah. And um, with regards to the university instructor, had you decided to go back and update your own credentials or become more... What happened was... Uh, when I became a university instructor, I was teaching undergraduates in visual communication design. Mm -hmm. Now, I had a bachelor's degree yeah. in visual art, so it responded somewhat to, uh, to my credentials, right. but I realized that if I wanted to pursue a career in academia, that I would have needed to uh, upgrade those credentials to uh, an advanced degree, a master's degree, or, or uh, a doctorate. Wow. Yeah. Is this where you met your wife, then? It is where I met okay. my wife. Um, I was exhibiting at a cafe, a collection of my paintings, um, and the owner of the cafe knew both my wife and myself, mm -hmm. and uh, she planned, planned she and planned. manipulated mm -hmm. a bit uh, that we would meet each right. other. And that's, and then what, it was just a bolt of lightning? And then it was a bolt of lightning was right really? from the beginning. We went out dancing the first night and that was it. It was... Uh, Truly. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Yeah. And um, did she spoke English? She spoke very little English and I had picked up Turkish actually. So we managed to cobble together our communication in both languages. Oh. But uh, primarily in Turkish because I had learned from... Turkish from the children that yes. I taught. Oh my god, I can and only imagine your first <laughs> conversation if you're speaking Turkish learned from children. Yeah. <laughs> well, it must have been uh, very gentle communication. Yes, <laughs> yeah. But we did manage to communicate and uh, now it's uh, we can pass from one language to another. You still speak Turkish then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. How did you convince her to come back here other than just blind love? Uh, well, that was... Uh, that was pretty much it. <laughs> that would probably take a whole other interview. Oh, uh, but, give, uh, us the, give us the bare details then. 
Uh, the bare details was that uh, I decided to um, pursue a master's degree at UBC mm -hmm. in landscape architecture. She was a practicing lawyer in Turkey. And uh, so to make the transition uh, to Canada as a lawyer would have been very difficult um, in terms of language barriers and whatnot. So uh, we decided that uh, if we were going to start a, a family that we would start it here in Canada. And so that was really the convincing part was that uh, we both decided we wanted to start a family here. So when that process began, she came to Canada. What was it like for her as a trained and practicing lawyer to give that up to come to another country? I think it was extremely difficult. And uh, going through that whole process gave me an appreciation for how hard it is for, for people coming to this country to adapt, to, um, to get on with their lives uh, fully and to integrate into Canadian society. It's, it's not as easy as people might think it is. And the whole process of immigration, um, a lot of my friends thought that if you marry someone, that automatically they become Canadian right. and it's easy for them to come I here. I think a lot of people think that. And it's not the case at all. Um, and increasingly, uh, there's more mistrust put on marriages between a Canadian and a, a, a foreign national. Mm -hmm. um, which I'm glad that we didn't have to go through. Our, our marriage uh, was looked at as legitimate, and right. you know, 12 years later, I can attest that, that it is legitimate. It is legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> Even on days when you both might be feeling <laughs> yeah. that you wished otherwise. Yeah. So you you did start a family. Yes. You have a daughter. She's yes. now seven. Para, she's yeah. seven, um, and she's going to school here in in Gatineau. Oh. Okay. So she's close. We decided that we wanted to, uh, because I went into politics, we shouldn't sacrifice our family life. Yeah. And so both of them are here with me now. Oh, that's yeah. that's very nice. Yeah. So you have an actual home here rather than just... Uh, that's correct. Okay. In Elmer, we, we live close to the river and yeah. uh, on weekends we go back to the riding. Okay. Yeah. Tell me um, a little bit about this decision to go back to school and um, and to study something different. Did you have an idea at that stage of what it was exactly that you wanted to do? Not exactly. Um, when I decided to go back to school, I thought it would be a Master's of Fine Art, just yeah. follow the path that I was taking. Sure. Um, I applied to Nova Scotia School of Art and mm -hmm. Design, and they rejected my, my application, which was heartbreaking to me. But after talking to one of my old professors in art, she said, well, my master's degree is not in art, it's in English. So she suggested to, to study something that, that uh, really interests you. Mm -hmm. That's now, good advice. Yeah, now art really interested me, but uh, I started thinking about other things. And uh, landscape architecture was one of the things that came out because it combined art and planning, the environment. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it really responded to the, the, my social values and, and my creative need. Right. And you worked in that field then? I did work yeah. in that field. I uh, got registered in Quebec, which requires working for two years in uh, uh, what they call a stagiaire in mm -hmm. Quebec. And I got my, uh, my seal uh, in 2010. Right. Um, so I was working in that field for, for right up until I got elected. But you were also doing a PhD I was, at McGill. I was doing a PhD okay. at McGill in uh, urban planning. All right. Yeah. So let's think about this. You're doing a PhD, and um, that's a pretty hefty workload. You're also working, and you have a young child. And um, all of a sudden, uh, was it all of a sudden, an election is called and you just decide to run, or what happened? What happened was uh, the summer prior, so summer of 2010, the party approached me to run as the candidate, and they had done so in 2008 as well. Mm -hmm. but in 2008, I decided not to because my wife wasn't comfortable with the idea. Uh, in 2010, uh, my daughter was older, and my wife seemed to be more okay with the idea mm -hmm. and uh, so they uh, the party asked me to run I said yes I filled out the the paperwork and the vetting papers and uh, I said but I'm doing a PhD right now I'm I'm have a lot of things on my plate so uh, I have to keep this under wraps and you know when the day comes we'll uh, 
will deal with it. Right. So when a couple of days before the writ was dropped, the party phoned me and said, are you still on? How long after um, did you get that call? Like from the time that you did all the paperwork and said, let's keep it under wraps. It would have been a now. good, uh, probably a good eight months. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it wasn't like an immediate thing, like you got the call the next day as in? No, okay. no. So they, uh, they were phoning me quite, uh, the party was phoning me quite regularly yes. uh, throughout the fall of 2010 and uh, early winter. I remember often riding my bicycle to McGill and getting a phone call and looking and it would be the party and I... And you'd I, hang up? I, I would not answer it because I would be thinking about things that yeah. I had to do that day. Right. Um, but when right before the writ was dropped and they phoned me, I realized that... Uh, they okay, were serious? It's serious and, yeah. and we're going forward Did with Did you this. consider backing out? Never. No? No. When I make a commitment, it's my my commitment is good tell me about how your wife responded at this point too because you'd said that you know the second time around she was a bit more favorable but um, as I understand it she just has also embarked on a new career herself and uh, in the field of fashion design and that she had just done a she's done a major show I think and yes. so here she is following this brand new path which undoubtedly requires a tremendous amount of work to get started mm -hmm. and you have your young daughter I mean, she may be seven now, but she's still young and needs care and attention. Yes. And here you are considering this move into a very public, uh, time-consuming realm. Mm -hmm. What was the discussion like around your supper table? <laughs> well, uh, when we could actually get together around the supper table, <laughs> sure. our discussion was that uh, we seem to be managing it okay so far. And we, we take it day by day. So uh, my wife just recently finished, uh, finished her program of studies. And during that last bit of time, when she was intensively preparing for the show at uh, the Olympic mm -hmm. Stadium in Montreal, um, I had my daughter with me here. So I was taking care of our daughter. And we, we have this, this agreement where we, we help each other out. Um, so that things work better. So there's never really any conflict between us. Uh, we seem to be going forward in in uh, in in a very healthy way, in very open communication with each other. Do you have care for your daughter here, or do you go pick her up at school and bring her to the house, and she does well, her homework? Well, that's in exactly your yeah. uh, what we would do. Uh, I yeah. would bring my daughter to the house, and uh, if I had votes, she would be in the lobby doing homework yeah. or on the iPad or yeah, and, God it, for iPads. <laughs> and it didn't seem to be uh, disruptive but she seemed to enjoy it sure. from from the first day that I won the election uh, I remember going home and uh, in the early hours of the morning and telling my daughter because uh, I had told her previously that I was in a contest to become one of the leaders of Canada trying to make it understandable to a six-year-old uh, I think she was six, uh, seven at the time, maybe. Um, and uh, when I went the morning of the victory and told her, Daddy now is one of 308 leaders of Canada, she just got this big smile on her face. So every time that I take her up here to the hill, yeah. it reminds her that her father's uh, in a leadership position in, in, in Canada. What was her first reaction when she saw the House of Commons? Um, or walked in with you? Her first impression when I sneaked her into the, the chamber and showed her the stained glass windows was she was quite impressed with the beauty yeah. of the chamber itself. Um, other than that, uh, other in, than my, that in my office... Other than that, she's a seven-year-old girl <laughs> that's and it's right. just your office. So in my office, yeah. there's a television, yeah. and that's the most important <laughs> thing to her in that office. TV Ontario, educational right. shows, yeah. stuff like that. That's terrific. Yeah. Um, tell me about life here in Ottawa then. It's got to be um, both similar and a little different than uh, other MPs because some people do choose to move their families mm -hmm. up here, especially if they've got young kids, mm -hmm. and some people don't. But a typical day for you, is it shorter in terms of that you don't have to do the receptions and such that a lot of other MPs do because you have the commitment to get home? Mm -hmm. Or what's your life like here? Well, I tend to balance. Uh, I try to keep a balance mm -hmm. between going to receptions. And I really look uh, at receptions in terms of my critic portfolio. If it's within energy or natural resources, then I would tend to attend 
to a reception yeah. to meet those people because I'm working with them right. uh, and building a network. Uh, if it's another reception, I don't go to receptions for reception for right. the, the sake of going to receptions. I, I keep a careful balance between family and uh, and those kind of activities. Yeah. Now, votes is a completely other other thing. Right. Uh, we have to be there for votes, so some nights go very late. Yeah. Are you glad that you made the decision to do this? Oh, yes. You are? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have you finished your PhD? I have not. Do you think you will? I, I hope to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Will you do it while an MP, or do you think you're going to try and just hold off for a little bit and I am juggle hoping only to do so it. many balls? I'm hoping to do it as an MP. Um, I look at Jack Layton, what he did in his public career, he managed to, to finish his doctorate at the same time, and yeah. I've received words of encouragement from other other officials that have done the same thing. So I'm hoping to, to, to finish it while yeah. being an MP. You know, one of the things I've wondered, and, and um, it's a question I'm sure you've been asked before, but um, when you put your name into the ring, did you, did you really think that it was a possibility? And, I, and that's not, you know, trying to be a trapping question. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. just that sometimes we make the decision because we think well, this is the good democratic thing to do. I'm going to do this because it's the right thing mm -hmm. to do. Um, and sometimes we do it because we really believe that we can make it happen. Where did you fall on that spectrum? Well, what happened in Quebec uh, in the May 2011 election was something that I had thought would happen for many years. And I had been in contact with the party as far back as 2004, 2005, saying that if uh, we positioned ourselves in a certain way in Quebec, that we would be able to make inroads. Uh, with that said, uh, I wasn't absolutely certain that this was the time mm -hmm. in 2011 that would it would happen. Um, as the campaign progressed, I realized that yes, it was, and people were uh, opening up to the idea that yeah. uh, the NDP could uh, take seats in Quebec. Um, but to be very frank, at the beginning, I thought it was a very small possibility. And I told uh, my wife that as well. I said, you know, the chances of me winning this are not very large, but I have to get out there and I have to speak of the values of the party that uh, I represent and I thought it was important in terms of our democracy. Okay, I have one last really quick question because we're almost out of time, but um, you ran against a friend. You'd gone to high school with uh, Mehdi Fai, mm -hmm. who was the MP, the, the incumbent MP. What did it feel like on election night um, to know that you had become the MP and that a friend, in the process that a, a friend mm -hmm. no longer was? Mm -hmm. Well, it was, Mehdi was a, a very old friend. We hadn't kept in close contact um, we went to grade 7 together and uh, after grade 7 I had gone to another school so we hadn't seen each other yeah. for... It wasn't like you were bosom buddies. No, we weren't bosom right. buddies. But uh, the night of the election I was in downtown Montreal with many of the, my NDP colleagues and uh, I realized that Meili was in the riding at a restaurant and as soon as I knew that I, I had won um, I drove out there and uh, went to go see her and uh, we had a very nice exchange and uh, it was, uh, I realized how much, how difficult it, it was to, to, to lose. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I always keep that in mind that uh, I don't own this position. It's uh, one day I may lose or may retire and that transition is not always easy. So uh, I always wish uh, Maylee well and uh, that's that's what I expressed to her, that yeah. uh, I hope that she would uh, continue to do good things. Thank you for taking the time to be Thank here. You. It's been a real pleasure to meet you. Same here, Catherine. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Mm -hmm.